Hey, Jess. Hey, how are you? I'm great. Uh, it's planning season. We are in the thick of Q4. And one thing that is always very top of mind is about budget, um, is marketing budget, campaign budget, headcount, et cetera. And a lot of times, I think almost every marketer can agree, they just need more budget. Um, <laughs> but there also seems to be among a lot of clients, sort of a like resignation that they get the budget they get usually in February. Um, and I remember when we were in house, things were very different and we did a lot more negotiating, like really actively having a conversation about what was realistic and achievable with different budget levels. Um, and I wanted to talk with you today about that, how you kind of built that practice at our old company um, and what tips you have. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I didn't know that that was a thing that you were just given a number. Yeah. Um, I had started at this company like right after, right out of grad school. And I was just like, oh, seems like the way to do it. Um, and then have since gone on to other companies and realized that that was kind of unique. Um, but yeah, so this is my favorite topic. Um, I love planning. I love like trying to figure out like what's the game plan um, and getting the team and, and, not only just your marketing team, but also the, the rest of the company on, on the same page. Um, and I always just kind of took a very mathematical approach to it because that's just kind of what came naturally to me. Um, and it did start out as like kind of fishing for information. Like I would just schedule a meeting um, with, you know, in our case, we were a small company at the time. It was really just the CEO and the CFO and the VP of sales um, that we were trying to just understand, like, what's the plan? <laughs> like, what are we trying to do next year? Are we trying to like grow 20%? Are we doubling, like tripling? What's the, what's the plan? Um, so to just kind of figure out like, what are we, what's the vibes um, that we're going for? Because we were VC backed. So the investors did have some expectations for what we were supposed to be doing. Um, and then you just, from there, kind of work back um, you know, there's a bunch of metrics and variables that go into that, like, how are you going to get there? So one is like, what's the average selling price? Like, how many reps are we going to have? Like, what are our conversion rates from MQL to SAL to SQL to our, and our win rate? Um, how long is our sales cycle? Um, are we launching any new products that we think are going to kind of change or alter um, or maybe have a different path um, than, than our existing book of business. Um, and then of course, like, where are we generating opportunities today? Like are, are, are they coming from marketing, from sales prospecting, BDRs, partners, um, and just kind of like mapping out um, and like doing that like reverse waterfall math from like, okay, if we're trying to get to a hundred million in revenue, then let me back out um, what do we, what does that mean we need to do? Um, deals of what size will right. generate. And then from there, you know, if our close rate is 5%, well, guess yeah. what? You need 20 X ops. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That. So yeah, I literally had a spreadsheet. Um, and I just like, womp, 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 like stuck them in there. And we had done a fair amount of just like reporting of like, how did we do this year so that we could get a, a sense of like, what is reality? Um, and then, you know, put in next year's revenue goals and then kind of see, okay, if that's the case, what, if we, if all of our like kind of performance metrics stay the same, what does that mean in terms of like the number of opportunities and leads that we need? And usually what would happen is it would spit out some like crazy number, like <laughs> you need so many opportunities to to hit this number. And then there would just be like some negotiation on like, okay, I think we can improve our win rate here. We can go after some bigger deals and grow our ESP there, or we're going to hire more reps. So we'll have more capacity. Um, and so then you just kind of start going through the scenarios of like, what is more or less feasible um, in terms of like, like gains that you can, you can make um, or, or some things that you just really don't think are going to be valuable. Like um, I remember one year we had a new product coming out that was, you know, we had a lot of high hopes for it, but the ASP was going to be quite low. Um, and so being honest about the fact that we were doing a big push and wanting to generate a bunch of leads and opportunities for an admittedly low ASP product, um, 
like that has some impact to 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 the rest of the business or or at least how you're going to generate the pipeline for the for the other side of the business. Yeah. Um so that was just all really helpful to kind of get a sense of like how are we going to hit the number which products or which segments are we going to focus on to get, to hit the number and which products and segments are we maybe not going to focus on or are we um not going to like prioritize as we go through. Right. Um and that was super helpful because I think it a lot of marketing teams, I think, feel a lot of pressure, especially if you're just kind of feeling like being kind of reactive to like what the sales team is telling you. Of course, every sales manager is going to think that their segment is the most important. And so you're just going to be getting every sales manager being like, well, I need to generate blah, 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 blah. And you're just like, oh my gosh. And so you're running campaigns to to feed this segment and you're running campaigns to feed that segment and you're running campaigns to feed um, you know, Europe and, and America and whoever. And it's just like, you can often like kind of get a little bit lost in the the noise and the activity and the marketing team is spinning, but they're not necessarily yeah, driving, you know, pipe. driving pipeline <laughs> um, and like focused on the main thing, like keeping the main thing, the main thing. Um, so that I always found super helpful. And it's a series of meetings, like, you, as you know, um, it's, it's a negotiation and change curve. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody is kind of like getting comfy with like, what this means, what it doesn't mean. And as the marketing person, marketing ops person, like you're like you're intimate um with these uh, metrics and and trying to understand like what are what which metrics are more or less sensitive and what what can you kind of give up um and still feel good about actually achieving. And then eventually you kind of get to like, okay, this is the, this is the plan. Like this is the revenue plan. This is what we're going to kind of sign up for. And, and it's never like hundred percent final, but like, this is generally the direction that we're going in. And then from there we go to the fun part, which is the marketing planning, um, which again, <laughs> I just made a math exercise. Um, and then you just kind of keep going with your reverse waterfall math. So now you've got the number of opportunities you need to hit by segment And so now you start doing, okay, now what campaigns and what channels am I going to be, you know, running to hit this number of leads and opportunities? Um, And so you can do your own analysis around, you know, conversion rates and past performance and where are you getting the the volume and the quality of leads um, coming in or, or where do you think that you can grow? Um, and then you're kind of making that plan and trying to figure out, okay, here's, here's now the set of channels and campaigns that I feel good about in terms of doing that. And then of course you're marrying that with like a more creative exercise (laughs) of like, okay, our focus is on Europe and product A, um, or whatever segments. And so what are the campaigns and channels that we think that we're going to run? And that was always super fun for us um, because it's almost like, it's like setting new year's resolutions. Like everything is possible. <laughs> but but uh, the math is the math. Like you're the not. The math is the math. Right. Yeah. If you have a thousand people in your database and you email them a webinar invite, 2% 100%. will click, 10% yeah. will convert on the webpage and 25% will actually attend. Like we can't assume we'll get 600 attendees. 100%, 100%. And it does it while you're while you're in a very creative exercise it's helpful to have that in the back of your mind that like you need to generate 600 opportunities and so if you're talking about like i don't know whatever campaign and you're like ooh but is this like really going to move the needle or is this just kind of like yeah. fun <laughs> um we're doing it cuz we always have or yeah. yeah it's just something that has always been done like it does make you think critically about some of the creative ideas. And that for me was kind of the power of it because a lot of people would have really good ideas um, or like, you know, your, your email marketing manager, or your digital marketing manager, or your events person, like they would have ideas, um, but they weren't necessarily empowered in my previous companies to like level up what those things might be. But as soon as you give people a goal and you're like, okay, here's the number, it's 600, like how are we going to get there? It just felt like that kind of opened up ideas. Um, and so that for me was really fun because, um, yeah, we it was usually for us like a few days stuck in a conference room 
Yeah. No bad ideas. Get it all down on paper. Let's figure out something. And and usually we come up with things that we were like really excited about. Or like the mops person would come and say, you know, when whenever we have campaigns with like these kinds of attributes, they do really well. And then that would kind of like spark some some new twists and turns on things that we could try out. Um, or new new processes, new tools like drift. You know, like yeah, introducing something like that that's going to help you deliver bofu like. Yes. Over and over and over again, very reliably. Um, you need that in the mix more than totally. webinars and events now. Totally. Yes. Yes. And yeah, often the MOPS person too would be saying, you know, our compared to industry standard, like our conversion from, um, you know, MQL to we get them on the phone is like super low. So like, what can we do about that? And then we'd often do um, planning, like with our BDR manager, trying to figure out like, what's their feedback? What are the best leads? What are the things that we can be changing about that process um, to get more people on the phone, more meetings, et cetera. Um, So yeah, yeah, that's the fun. The temptation of most marketing managers (laughs) to iterate and invest at Tofu, like where they have the most control. And at that company, I think we all were very focused on opgen and the process when we passed over a lead, what actually happened to them? What was the script? Like, what was the sales loft cadence and sync and, you know, templates? We cared really deeply because we were all so aligned to like, the, if we generate this number, we will hit type. Totally. Um, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I always thought that that was just kind of how it was. Um, But then when I went to other companies and it was just really not that, and it was so interesting because without the math as like the backdrop, you are just kind of going off things that you just kind of think are interesting, which, you know, is cool, um, but it can be so validating to like have a plan and then have that plan actually work. Like I, I, like when we do this exercise, like we'll kind of go back you know, at the end of Q1 or at the end of Q2, like, how do we do against like our assumptions? Like what was our ASP actually? And like, what was our sales cycle actually? Like how many, how many leads do we bring in? Did they actually convert to opportunities at the rate that we thought we would? Um, And, you know, of course some channels don't, and that's like a great learning because you've got to figure out like, why, why did that happen necessarily? Or why, um, you know, how can we actually, (laughs) yeah, yeah, stop funding it, (laughs) just kill it and then move on. Um, but it was like, so validating to like, actually like hit the plan, like exactly the way we planned it. And, and especially like the segment conflict, like that had always been a little bit challenging for me in the past. Um, but having, having a plan that like, okay, segment A is the priority, then segment B, then segment C, and then have it come out that way, um, where segment A is actually driving the volume and the conversions. That was just it just felt like, yes, we're like a lot, like it, that felt very gratifying that like the alignment was there from the beginning. And it wasn't who's loudest. It wasn't who's the crankiest. Right. The entire leadership function agreed in advance that marketing would, you know, put 70% of their resources behind yeah. this group. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So that was kind of the idea. And then from there, like once you kind of have a sense of like, okay, this is the marketing plan I feel confident in, in terms of like the campaigns I'm going to run, the channels I think that we need to invest in, um, in order to hit these kind of lead and opportunity goals. Um, then of course you got to figure out like how much is this all going to cost? Um, and again, I feel like for a lot of companies, there's this disconnect between the budget usually comes out in like, I don't know, February. And by then you're already like running campaigns. Like you've already committed to some things. (laughs) Um, But in October, in the previous October is when you're like coming up with all these plans. Um, And I just felt like, of course, like you should just say what the budget needs to be. Um, And so, and one of the, one of our CMOs was super proactive and taught me a lot about just kind of like taking control of your own destiny. Um, And so again, we did the same sort of exercise. Here's, here's the channels. Here's what we think we're going to get out of it. Here's what we think the cost per lead or the cost per opportunity is going to be, or what we need to invest in each channel. And then that kind of came up with our programs budget. And then, um, 
you know, we had, you know, other things we're planning for like travel, whatever, whatever, um, technologies, that kind of thing. Um, and then we would go to the CEO with like, here's what we think our budget needs to be. And if the CEO comes back and is like, no, it's like 80% of that or whatever, then you have, then, then you have a, then you have math again, where you can say, okay, if it's 80% less, then here's what I would cut. Um, and but with that cut comes yeah, pipeline and, implications. Yeah. 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 And some of that might be non-programmed things, but probably some of it is. And then if that's true, then I really think that I can only generate this much. Um, and then as soon as you have a spreadsheet up where you're kind of saying like, let me take a cut, here's what I would cut, here's where I'm prioritizing, they kind of see like, what am I missing? Like, like, what am I giving up by not investing in these channels? And I think for CEOs, like it can be, and I mean, I've worked for many different CMOs and they vary in terms of their ability to get across how they're going to use the money. Mm -hmm. Um, I think for a lot of CEOs, it's very unclear, like for every dollar I give you, where are you going to invest it? And what am I going to get back? Um, and so like being explicit about that, I think is super helpful. And especially if you're just proactively doing that, as opposed to like, stopping three steps ago and being like, even if we get on the same page in terms of like revenue and opportunities and leads, you can't just sign up for those numbers for any budget. Like, so right. like you have to keep going um, and, and, and kind of pair that with the budget and say, okay, this is, this is how it's going to work. And of course, as with all things, it's a negotiation and like, is there some padding? Of course. <laughs> um, but <laughs> But you want to get to a point where you feel confident um, that like with this budget, these set of tactics, like I will be able to like, for like reliably produce this number of leads and opportunities because that's what you're signing up for. And at the end of Q1, when you generate all of your, your leads and opportunities, like you can look back and be like, this is, this was like my best foot forward. Like nobody was like, you know, set up for failure. Yeah. Um, and that's what I felt like on some of my previous marketing teams was like, sure, we're signing up for the number and we, our budget isn't 50% of what it was last year. And we all know we're not going to hit any of these goals and we're all just coming in day after day. And, you know, at the end of the quarter, it's going to all be in red and like, nobody feels good about that. So like, yeah. instead of just like resigning yourself to <laughs> like being it's in a it is. Yeah. downward spiral, like just kind of like taking charge. And, and if, if you can't get on the same page, then that's tough. Um, but I think, I think marketers and CMOs have more power than they think they do. Um, if they can speak in the same language as the rest of the executive team, which is, is quantitative. Um, and so if you can come to the table with a well thought out, like systematic approach to how am I going to generate needs and pipeline? I think that just really, really helps your team produce and succeed. I know too, that demonstrating kind of benchmarking what is our actual cost per lead and cost per op yes per channel and then how are we getting more efficient also yes. seems to open up budget left and right like we used to be at $200 a lead we've brought it down to 150 a lead give us yes. $5000 more yes you can trust we will spend it wisely and grow more efficient as we go Totally. Yes. Just like we're assuming sales is going to be able to boost ASP or close deals faster. Marketing has to become more efficient in terms of cost per lead and cost per opportunity. So, so showing that you're aware of this game that we're all playing, that we have to get better um, and, and showing how you're going to do that and use the budget wisely. Yes. I, again, I think that just sits you at the same table Um and yeah, allows you to kind of be a part of that decision-making process as opposed to just kind of being given a number. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jess. Um, if you want to learn more about Sponge, visit sponge.io. Thanks, Al. Bye.